Welcome in, you guys, and congratulations on surviving the three-week break. My name is Sai, and today we are here to talk about the latest chapter of One Piece and just break it down a little bit. So with that being said, let's get to it. So the first thing we have this week when we break open the chapter is another canon cover page story. We got volume three of Yamato's journey. And this time around, we actually see that Kinemon is giving Yamato some money. Yamato is really happy about it. You see like the little heart emojis coming out of her. And apparently Kinemon has a favor to ask as well. I am going to be completely honest. I have no idea what Kinemon could be asking of Yamato. So I actually brainstormed just a little bit. You know, I, I don't want to think too hard on this one because we don't have too much to go off of. But I was like, okay, this whole cover page story is called Yamato's Journey to the Temple. And so far, I mean, of course, we're only three volumes in, but so far we haven't seen any temples. So maybe Kinemon is asking Yamato to go visit the temples around Wano and he's giving her money so that she can travel and buy food and stuff you know like a little kid right like hey here's an allowance go go have some fun with your friends maybe it's something like that and that's why Yamato is really happy because she wants to travel around Wano anyways so I do think that could be pretty solid it is a little bit of a mundane answer but hey anything could happen here uh another thing I thought of was that maybe Kinemon is paying Yamato for training Momonosuke right because Yamato she's not technically a retainer so I don't know if she gets paid but hey, like if she's training Momonosuke, then that is pretty big, right? I mean, hey, here you go. Thanks for teaching him hockey. You know, thanks for teaching him about Kaido's abilities or, you know, the dragon fruit. There's a lot of things that could be on that end. Um, another thing I thought of, but this is more headcanony, but maybe Kinemon wants Yamato to clean up the beast pirates around Wano because we know they're kind of just chilling around, right? Like we don't know where they are, but hey, King, Queen, Babanuki, they were all hanging out at Udon Prison. So I'm assuming the other Beast Pirates are still around the area too, but just split up, right? We don't know where the Toby Ropo are. We don't know where Jack is. We don't even know where the remnants of the Big Mom Pirates are either. So maybe they're just chilling around the outskirts of Wano and Kinemon's like, hey, here's some money. Get rid of those guys. So there are a lot of possibilities here, uh, but I do want to stick with the simple answer and say that Kinemon just wants Yamato to travel around Wano to the temples. Uh, maybe the money isn't even for her. Maybe the money is for those temples so that they can help rebuild. Uh, I feel like there are some pretty plausible options here, and I would love to hear what you guys have to say about this. What do you think Yamato and Kinemon are up to? But also, we do have to remember that while this is a very happy-go-lucky cover page story right now, Eventually, it's gonna get crazy, right? Almost every single canon cover page story, by the end of it, gets pretty wacky. Maybe even Cross Guild appears here because we do know that they are after the Roponoglyphs, right? Like, Wano is an essential stepping stone for anyone who wants to become Pirate King. And Buggy said he wanted to become Pirate King. So maybe Mihawk shows up. Maybe Crocodile shows up. Or maybe even the Grand Jester himself shows up. Uh, there's a lot of things here, man. There's a lot of things. Oh, yeah, and of course, Blackbeard because the ancient weapons and caribou. So, yeah. yeah. Like I said, everything is looking really happy so far in Wano, but eventually, it's all gonna go to hell. On a side note, though, one thing I would really love to see out of the Wano cover page stories would be the forest that Green Bull created. Like, I don't know if you guys remember this, but when Aramaki came to Wano, and, you know, he was walking through the desert, walking straight to, you know, the flower capital. Behind him, he was creating flowers and greenery in the desert. So it's like, yo, that desert is probably a lush forest right now. So I kind of want to see, like, the aftermath of that. You know, like, oh, Aramaki came here to destroy Wado? But instead, he ended up doing them a solid. Yeah, I, I think that'd be pretty funny. And maybe that's Green Bull's gag, right? Like, every admiral has some sort of gag. Uh, of course, right now, everybody just thinks that Armaki is a bigot, and I think that is very fair. That could be his gimmick. But what if his gimmick instead is that everything he tries to do, he ends up doing the exact opposite of it, right? Like destroying Wano, leaving it better. Beating Weevil, making him skinny. Like, things like that. I think that would be pretty hilarious, but yeah, again all kind of headcanon right there. So now, on to the actual chapter. First page, we see that Venus has cleaned up the pacifista. But also, you know, before we talk about Venus, we have this, like, offshore shot of Egghead Island, and we don't see the ancient robot. Last chapter, you know, the three-week cliffhanger we got 
was the ancient, sorry, <laughs> my cat's still on my lap. The ancient robot just, you know, standing up in the middle of all the fire. And then we come to this chapter, very first panel. It's almost the exact same shot, but this time the ancient robot is nowhere to be seen. Like the, the guy has disappeared. How do we lose track of a robot that is bigger than the giants? He looked bigger than the island. I, I mean, hey, we don't see a glimpse of him in this chapter. Nobody even mentions him. No Marines talk about him. The Straw Hats don't see him. Dorian Brogy don't see him. Like, where did this guy go? Bro, where did the ancient robot go? It's like David Blaine. He just disappeared. Wait, sorry, not David Blaine. Um, Houdini. Houdini is the magician that is known for disappearing, right? Well, I guess every magician can disappear. But Houdini is like, oh, look at that guy. He just pulled the Houdini. Uh, but yeah, ancient robot. He pulled the Houdini. We don't know where he's at. Knowing Oda, we probably won't see him for a while. Like, it'll probably be like one or two chapters before we see that guy again. Because that is just how it's been. We see the ancient robot. His eyes glow. We cut away 10 chapters later. We cut back. He's still glowing. <laughs> you know, we cut away. Oh my God, he's standing up. And now we cut away again. Like, hey, give him like three or four chapters. He'll do something. Maybe, maybe the ancient robot will start moving and doing things in tandem with Vegapunk's message. I think that'd be great, actually, you know? We learn information about the Void Century, and while that's happening, we have a monster, monster, we have a robot from the Void Century going berserker mode, right? Yeah, 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 I, I think that'd be pretty solid. But yeah, back to the chapter now, Venus has subdued all of the pacifista, and God, man, this guy's a monster, right? Like right now, I know we kind of look at the pacifista and we're like, oh, the Straw Hats could do that too. And yeah, that's that's fair. But we got to remember, man, one single pacifista pre time skip gave the Straw Hats a run for their money. Venus seemingly took out 50 of these guys in a matter of seconds. Like that is really impressive. He's over here one shotting these guys, freezing their control chips so that they can use them later. And it's like, dang, man, Venus is putting in work, bro. He's putting in work. Um, I do like that he is really fast. I, I mean, obviously he's a horse, but he's a skeleton horse. So he's like super duper fast, right? Brook. Brooke can run on water because he's a skeleton. Give that to a horse. Oh my god, you know, like Venus is pretty crazy. Yeah, th these are some speed feats we are witnessing here. So now that Venus has handled all the pacifista, he has now set his sights on Bonnie because Bonnie is pretty much the mastermind of all the pacifista right now. If they want the pacifista back by the end of this arc, they need to take her down. So he starts making this mad dash to the giant ship. And what we see right after that, you know, the next two panels, after Venus starts flying off to Bonnie, we see Oimo and Kashi. And these guys, man, they're like, hey, Oimo, time to head back to the ship. And then Kashi's like, whoa, the situation's getting bad. Let's go. And I'm like, wait a minute. You know, wait a minute. You know, if Venus shows up to the giant ship, does that mean that Oimo and Kashi are going to step in next chapter and potentially fight this guy? I mean, of course, we're all looking forward to Sanji versus Venus since he's the closest guy to the ship. But honestly, there's a chance that Oimo and Kashi might be the ones who fight this guy. Like, and if that happens, oh, oh, man. I mean, <laughs> we already had Dorian Brogy chop Jupiter in half and block Warkuri and, you know, slap him back. So Oimo and Kashi clashing with Venus and doing pretty decently wouldn't be super shocking, but I do think it would be kind of crazy, you know, because we, everybody holds Venus to this pedestal, which uh, I, I'm sorry, I always pronounce it really badly. Uh, some people called me out on that. They're like, oh, why does Sai say pedestal? <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, pedestal. Uh, we put Venus on this pedestal because, you know, he has a sword. He's probably going to be Zoro's opponent. So if Oimo and Kashi step in and they, they kind of handle this guy decently, I, I don't know if that's going to raise the Venus stocks or if it's going to just raise the giant stocks or vice versa. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it would be a really fun matchup, though. You know, Oimo Kashi versus a swordsman. Come on. Come on. I think that could be pretty fun. Uh, but you know, it's not fun. You know, t t time to take the smile away for a minute, guys. You know, everybody press F for respect because Frankie, man, Frankie beats Red King. Vice Admiral Red King goes down all right so he, he, here's the thing i you could go back to the videos man you can go back chapters and chapters ago i said yo the straw hats can beat the vice admirals frankie versus those three money's on frankie I, 
I've said it. You know, right hand to God, I've said that before. This is my left hand, but you guys know what I mean. But while I did think that Frankie could win this fight, never have I ever thought that Frankie could beat them in a singular hit. One strong right is all it took. All right, all right, all right, dude. These VAs are booty. You know, I, I've been trying to stand up for these guys time and time. Dude, you guys can s go back and see the cope. Tosa, oh, Tosa lost to Bargi? Oh, it's because he got, you know, he got hit from behind. It was, it was a cheap move. He got snaked. I can cope for these guys all day long. But Red King losing to Frankie with a strong right? Oh, my God. I can't make up excuses anymore. You know what I mean? Like, ah. Yeah, no, no, no. Red King got done super dirty. And, and it's not like I want Frankie to look bad. No, that is not the case. I, I know Frankie is that guy. But I also thought Red King would be that guy too, man. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, Red King even has the crazy robotic arm. He, he's kind of like this weird bootleg version of Zephyr. I was like, dang, man, strong right versus the right arm. Oh, it's going to clash. It's going to be beautiful. And then you go down. And not only does Red King get knocked out in a singular blow. Brother, if you look at the panel where Red King is beaten, his arm is broken too. Frankie took that guy's arm, dude. We're going to have another Eustis kid over here. You know, it's going to be like Shanks of the Marines. Oh, man. Oh, that's so painful. Yeah. Hearts go out to Red King. Um, the Vice Admirals, they're, they're, they're absolute fodder now. Um, at this point, I saw somebody say this online, and I totally agree. But at this point, just just give Kobe the rank of Vice Admiral, bro. Like, come on. Kobe's a captain right now. I think there's a couple of levels above captain before he hits Vice Admiral. But at this point, if this is how the VAs are performing, just, just give Kobe the VA title, man. <laughs> yeah, it's just a sad sight to see overall, man. Like, these guys didn't even land a single blow on Frankie, right? Like, maybe if Frankie beat Red King, and then Frankie's like, oh... That guy was tough. I'd be like, wow, respect on Red King. Thank you, Frankie. Come again soon. But that didn't happen. Frankie beat this guy and no words were spoken. <laughs> it's actually like this fight never even happened. No, no, no. This guy got no diffed. And then I was reeling, right? You know, me, the vice admiral sympathizer, I was, I was already reeling. And then what we see next, <laughs> what we see next was, I, I, I would call it a war crime. But, you know, Bonnie hands off her dad to, to a giant. Well, we'll talk about that here in a second, because that, that's an actual big plot point I do want to get to. Uh, but yeah, Bonnie hands off her dad. And then this is when Pomsky says, hey, Bonnie, give us back that war machine. Give us back that government weapon. Nobody wants their dad to be addressed like that. So Bonnie, rightfully so, goes in to fight Pomsky. But I want to use the word fight very loosely, because Bonnie goes in, she touches Pomsky's face. Pomsky then turns into like this five-year-old boy and then Bonnie kicks him to next Tuesday and that's it <laughs> the end of Pomsky guys oh man this is this is this is bad dude it, it's a bad day to be a vice admiral fan I mean thank thank the heavens we have Garp on our side right yeah, thankfully we have Garp the vice admiral carrying these bozos but man see Red King I can kind of forgive it, right? Frankie, strong, yeah, okay, okay. I, 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 I've come to terms with it. But Bonnie turning this guy into a kid? Do these VAs have no hockey? <laughs> Does this guy have no hockey? I, I'm not expecting this guy to pull a law and just, you know, and then, you know, the hockey lightning comes out and then he reverts the devil fruit powers. I wasn't expecting that. But at least like some basic stuff, right? Like maybe Bonnie would be like, oh, like my devil fruit doesn't work on this guy. I actually have to fight him fist to fist. That didn't happen, dude. This guy just got turned into a kid. And I honestly think the Vice Admiral agenda is over, man. It's 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 gone. It's in the dumpster. I, I mean, I'm always going to stick up for these losers because that's what I like to do. I, I like looking out for the little guys. Uh, so I'll always find ways to cope for them. But I, I will admit my faith wavered a little bit with this chapter. The one thing I am thankful for is that this didn't happen to any beloved vice admirals. Like, imagine if this happened to Smoker, right? Frankie, strong right, you know, Bonnie, boop, boop, boop. Oh, man, that would have been rough. Thankfully, Smoker isn't a victim yet. Thankfully, Doll isn't a victim yet. And I would say the same for any of the older generation of vice admirals, too. Like, imagine if this was Doberman. 
Imagine if this was Momonga. Like, oh man, that would have been that would have been rough. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. We, we we still have Smoker to fall back on, guys. Smoker and Doll. Okay, please carry us, guys. P please carry carry the Vice Admiral agenda to New Horizons. Uh, but yeah, th there is another Vice Admiral here on this battlefront. Uh, we see Guillotine in the background, but. He doesn't even try to fight anybody. I, I mean, he sees Bonnie kick Pomsky, and he's like, wow, you're awful. And then that's pretty much it. You know, like, we don't see that guy for the rest of the chapter. And honestly, at this point, he should just go back home. I, I mean, if you're a vice admiral, this is not your battle, guys. Like, <laughs> why did you even show up in the first place? I, I really don't know. Uh, but yeah, um, shout outs to Pomsky and Red King who just lost. I'd probably just quit the Marines. It, it's just embarrassing, man. Actually embarrassing. Uh, so now, time to talk about actually important events. Uh, Bonnie, like I said, handed off her dad to a giant. The reason I want to point that out is because at the end of this chapter, we're going to skip ahead a little bit, but at the end of the chapter, Venus shows up in front of Bonnie and Frankie. And when Venus makes his appearance here, you actually see a giant go down in the background. I think that's the same giant that's holding on to Kuma here. Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I tried looking at the pictures side by side, and I think it's him because they both have the beard and they have like the little sword thingy, but I'm not 100% sure. It's just really hard to tell, and I don't want to be racist, but a lot of these giants, man, they kind of they, <laughs> they kind of look the same. You know, they kind of look the same to me. So yeah, uh, there is a chance that Kuma is now like fallen on the ground and maybe that could spur him to get back up. Maybe that'll make Bonnie enraged even. And I think that could play a pretty big role in the Venus fight as well. But yeah, that's something we'll find out next chapter. So now we cut over to the Labo phase and we have the adventures of Marcus Mars and York the satellite taking place. They're going around trying to find out where the broadcast is coming from. And this first leads them to the broadcast room, the room shown in the video feeds. And Marcus Mars destroys that room without a moment's hesitation. And it is really cool. We don't know how he does it. I'm assuming it just comes from his mouth, but he shoots out this giant, like, Hamehameha Gallic gun attack. And it's like, dang, dude, that looks awesome. That looks awesome. I'm not too sure what it is even because it has these like electrical effects going around it. So that's why I referenced Dragon Ball Z here. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if it's fire. I don't know if it's a laser beam. I don't know what this is, but Marcus Mars can do it. All of these Gorse members have very unique abilities, right? Like Saturn, he has poison. Venus can freeze people. Marcus Mars, giant energy beam, I guess. You know, like, I wonder what the rest of the Gorse have now. You know, Jupiter, can he shoot out sand because he's a sandworm? What about Warkity? I don't know, man. Well, then again, uh, Warkity could turn his uh, tusk into blades. So maybe that's his great yokai ability, but I highly doubt it. I feel like he still has more in the bag that we haven't seen yet. Actually, I feel like all of the Gorsei have more in their bags that we just haven't seen. And that's what makes them so exciting. I love seeing the wacky abilities that they have. Because since we're dealing with yokai's mythologies here, I feel like Oda could go absolutely bonkers with them. And so far... He has, you know, he has been going bonkers. Uh, so yeah, Marcus Mars destroys the broadcasting room and York says, hey, wait a minute, guys. Let's let's not be reckless, right? If I were the Stella body, I'd use a Haishin Denden Mushi and hide it somewhere on the island. And then Mars's response is, oh, okay, then I guess I'll just destroy the entire Labo phase. And I don't know why, but it's such a simple line and it's such a straightforward thought that it seems really cool, right? It's a feat, like, oh, I'm just gonna destroy the whole Sky Island then. Like, dang, okay, Marcus Mars, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, but before he can actually do that and execute this idea, uh, York dials it back and says, hey, no, 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 that's a bad idea because if you destroy the entire Labo phase, you're gonna blow up all of the weapons, all of the experiments we have here, and that's just gonna destroy the entire island. Like, it, it's gonna cause a chain reaction that you do not want Marcus Mars. And Mars actually heeds these words. I, I was really shocked because, you know, if, if you cut over to Japanese, it doesn't seem that York is being that respectful to Marcus, right? You know, York is kind of just blabbering it out. And Marcus Mars is like a, yeah, she has a point, right? Yeah, I don't want to affect punk records. I have to be careful. And then York even, you know, she doubles down and she's like, hey, if you destroy punk records, if something bad happens here because of you, you'll have to deal with me. And then she, she whips out the bubble gun. And I'm like, dang, okay. Like, I wasn't expecting this from York. Like, honestly, I was expecting York to kind of be like Rob Lucci, where she's more fearful than anything. She's trying to be really respectful to him. But no, that's not the case, man. York is uh, really putting her foot down. She's really making her thoughts known to this guy. And Marcus Mars, 
kind of sees her as the voice of reason, right? Like at the end of the day, they don't want to destroy this island. They want punk records. They want the weapon. They want the mother flame. So in a way, Yorick is kind of like the voice of reason here, which is really odd to say. So after York's words of wisdom, Marcus Mars takes a second to think about where this Denden Mushi would be hiding. And that is when he hears a voice coming from punk records. And that's really impressive. That is really, really impressive. And the reason I say that is because in that same panel where Marcus Mars says that he hears something, you have many sound effects going off in the distance. You have screaming, you have earthquakes, you have rumbling, you have cannon fire. And it's like, yo, Marcus Mars was able to pick up the sound of a Dendan Den Mushi. And another thing too is I don't even know what he hears. Like, I'm just assuming it's the Dendan Den Mushi. But is it making sounds? Like, is it making like the sounds? Like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what Marcus Mars may have heard here, but his intuition is spot on. Uh, there is a small part of me that does wonder if this is just insane observation hockey or maybe if it's just an Itsumare power, or maybe this could even be the voice of all things and he just hears what he wants to hear. I'm really not too sure. So now that Mars has picked up on this sound, he tells York to take him to the entrance of Punk Records. And man, I really wish we got to see the entrance because to me, Punk Records still doesn't make any sense. It's like the rooftop of Egghead Island. It's also, you know, tilted, but also it's a place you can go to. And also it's where Vegapunk's brains are stored. Like, we don't really know what it looks like. And even by the end of this chapter, when we see Marcus Mars arrive at Punk Records, it's just a giant dark room. Like what is going on there? I'm not too sure. But obviously, you know, as the chapters go on, as we see what Marcus Mars is seeing, I'm sure everything will start falling into place. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how they enter it. Do they just fly up to it? Is there a door that leads them to this crazy stairway? I have no idea. So cutting over to the control room, we see Kaku and Sussy chatting it up a little bit. They're talking about the giant bird monster that was just here. Kaku's like, hey, what was that thing? Stussy says, oh, based on the way he was talking, that must be a member of the Gorosei. And Kaku responds to this by saying, ah, yes. What a terrifying transformation. Just what I'd expect from a member of the Gorosei. And I'm like, what do you mean, Kaku? Is that line implying that some people know that the Gorosei have demon transformations and scary forms? Because, you know, even thinking back to when Saturn first made landfall here on Eket Island, we had random Marines announcing his arrival. They were like, hey, anyone below Vice Admiral rank, don't look at this guy right? Like, maybe this is well known. Maybe the Marines and some world government agents have an inkling of an idea what these guys are actually capable of. And actually, I wouldn't be super shocked. I'm sure rumors get around, right? Like, hey, I heard St. Saturn's a crazy demon spider guy. Oh, Marcus Mars? I think he's a bird. I like to imagine there's some theorists in the Marines and world government. They're just like us at the end of the day, right? They're probably theorizing what their bosses can do. Like, oh, the Gorosei? <laughs> I think they're all awakened Zoans. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not super shocked. I'm not super shocked. But yeah, Kaku goes on and tries to take a stab at Stussy by saying, hey, you betrayed CP0 for the Straw Hats, and now... It looks like the Straw Hats are just throwing you away. But Stussy corrects him. And she's like, no, 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 that's not the case. I volunteered to stay here myself. And that is when we find out that Stussy is going to be the one who disables the Labo phase barrier so that the Straw Hat crew and the satellites can make their escape from this sky island. And you know what? I respect it. No, no. Major shout outs to Stussy for taking one for the team. Uh, of course, it makes a lot of sense considering the fact that the Vegapunks are the one who made her. Well, technically, it was the Mads team that made her, but Vegapunk is still her creator, right? Like, she owes Vegapunk her entire existence. So it makes sense as to why she would take the fall here. And I really hope that she makes it out of this alive. Hopefully, Stussy, after deactivating the barrier, can use her bat wings and just fly to the Thousand Sunny or fly to the giant ship or fly off the island. I think that could happen, but honestly, I'm not too sure because the opposite exists where she could just get captured by CP0 and the Gorosei. Because when you think about it, right, Kaku is still in this room. Kaku is still in his bubble. Marcus Mars told Rob Lucci that he would try to save Kaku, right? He's not going to go all out for Kaku, but if he can save Kaku, he probably will. So if Marcus Mars 
clears up the issue with the dented Mushi in the broadcast, and he comes back for Kaku, and Stussy is still here, then she's going to become a prisoner of the world government. Uh, well, one thing I did find kind of interesting is the fact that Marcus Mars was in this room and he didn't save Kaku yet. I mean, you know, it, it makes sense because Marcus Mars is under a time constraint. He only had like six minutes last chapter. He only has four minutes and one minute in this chapter to get the job done. So I don't blame him for not saving Kaku right away. But I will admit, I do find it kind of funny that he didn't save Kaku yet. Like, he was in the room. Like, he must have seen Stussy, Kaku... And instead, he only focused on York, right? He saw him, he was like, ah, Kaku, I'll come back later. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, Marcus Mars, he's doing his job. Like I said, I can't blame him for that. Uh, but now we go on and we see the Thousand Sunny group. We see Nami, Chopper, Usopp, Brooke, and Robin, and they're all preparing to escape. Uh, Usopp says, right when Zoro and Jinbei show up, they're going to coup de burst out of here. Edison says that that isn't possible, right? You know, Edison says he wants to believe in miracles, but at the end of the day, he is a scientist. And the Thousand Sunny has a 100% chance of failure if they were to leave right now. So Edison takes the fall and he says, I'm going to grab us something to get us out of here safe and sound. So what Edison does is he blasts off and goes through the Labo phase barrier, sustaining a lot of damage, right? I think it was like 78% damage, dude. <laughs> yeah, Edison is sacrificing himself, which again, makes a lot of sense. He is just a satellite. As long as the Straw Hats and the Stella body make it off of this island, then the satellites have succeeded at the end of the day. Uh, one thing I am still really curious about is just the Stella body. Like, from what we know, and from what we've seen with the uh, the heartbeat monitor going flat and with Vegapunk being X'd out in the eyes when Oda drew him, like it really does seem like Vegapunk is dead dead, but none of the satellites have said a single word about Stella being dead. Not York, not Edison, not Atlas, not even Lilith has said anything about Stella. So it's like, yo, like do these guys know something that we don't? Do they think that Stella is still alive? Do they just not know the updates of Egghead Island? I I'm not super sure. Uh, you know, I I'm still leaning on the side that maybe there's a way that Vegapunk can create a brand new body, but I have no clue. I, I mean, all of the Vegapunk satellites are still functioning. Punk Records is still functioning. So it seems like the Nomi 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 is still in play. But then again, Vegapunk is a genius, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he does have a second body or if he found ways for the satellites to survive even after he dies. I, I, I have no clue. It's just one of those things that's hard to guess because we are dealing with the world's smartest man. Like, Oda could say that Vegapunk has been planning for this for the past 50 years because he's just that dang smart, and I would believe it. You know, that's just how it is with these characters. Like, they're just too dang smart. And at this point, if Vegapunk were to come back into the story, alive again, I really wouldn't bat an eye. So that's enough time spent up in the clouds, and it's time to go back down to the Fabrio phase of Egghead Island and talk about Luffy, Dory, and Brogy versus Jew Peter and Warkudy, because we get some pretty cool things here. Uh, right when we hop into the battle, Jew Peter is probably using one of the sillier attacks in the series, which I really love. I, I don't know why, but whenever I see Jew Peter just inhale everything around him, it just brings a smile to my face because you know that in his human body, the guy is just standing here like, <sighs> it's like, damn, dude, okay. Jupiter is just really going in here. And here's the thing, the winds he's producing or th the suckage that he's producing here is so strong that even the Marines off the coast are reporting it. They're like, yo, these winds are something else, man. We got some strong winds on the island. Even Dory and Brogy are trying to make a run for it. So Luffy sees this as a problem. So what he does is he turns around, he grabs a building, and he says, eat this. And he just shoves it down Jupiter's throat. And that is just the last we see of Jupiter, man. Like for the rest of the chapter, he's just off on the side eating that building, right? He's just guzzling it down. Uh, Luffy expended too much energy, though, because of this attack. And now he is going out of gear fifth. Dorian and Brogy are like, whoa! This guy must need some food. So they just whip out this fermented shark meat and feed it to Luffy. Just, just for no reason, no explanation. Hey, you want my snack, Luffy? You know, here you go. You know, it's it's in my pocket. I was saving it just for you. And it's like, wow, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. Uh, so one thing to make note of here is that I do think this fermented shark meat 
is tied to Joy Boy? Because we have to remember, the Giants, they have ties to the Sun God. They celebrate the Winter Solstice. You know, we have the giant straw hat. These Giants know their stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised if this fermented shark meat ends up being Joy Boy's favorite food. And yeah, I know that could be a little bit of a stretch, but check this out, guys. Check this out, boys and girls. But if you go to Roger's Vivery card, Goldie Roger, the Pirate King, right? <laughs> the Pirate King. You'll notice that Roger's favorite food is actually shark meat. Shark meat, fermented shark. There's something up with these legendary characters for some reason liking shark meat. So yeah, I, I do think Hakaro or the fermented shark that Luffy's eating in this chapter is somehow related to Joy Boy. Wouldn't be super shocked, right? Wouldn't be super shocked. So now that Luffy's got his grub in, he's back at full strength, right? He starts flexing at Dorian Brogy. He feels much better now. But that being said, he doesn't go gear fifth again. I don't know if he can. Maybe he used too much stamina. Maybe he just doesn't want to overexert himself. But instead, he ends up going gear third and he turns his attention to Warkuti because Warkuti is right behind him. You know, Warkuti is gaining up on him. So Luffy uses Red Rock on him. He hits him dead in the head. But instead of Warkuti going down, he eats the attack. He doesn't budge. And what happens next is egregious, but Luffy's hand is actually in pain. It's shambling, dude. It's crazy. I mean, what's crazy about this is that this is the same attack that knocked Kaido down. And yes, you know, Kaido wasn't in his hybrid form. He wasn't in his dragon form. So it's not like super crazy. So it's not like Warkuni based on this one feat alone is stronger than Kaido by any means, but it still is really, really impressive. And what I found really funny is that after Warkuni takes this attack, he doesn't say anything. I, I mean, like, you know, Luffy's like, ah, my hand. And then the next panel, Warkuni's just like, no words, no nothing, no ouch, no, oh, I'm gonna get you, Luffy. No, 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 no. Instead, he just has this thousand yard stare going on when looking at Luffy. And it makes me wonder what's going through his head right now. Like maybe since Luffy whipped out this fire-based ability, Warkuni is having Joy Boy flashbacks. That could be it, because this is the first attack that Luffy has used so far against the Gorosei that has his iconic fire behind it. So maybe Warkadi's having some PTSD going on. And, you know, now that I think about it, isn't it kind of interesting that Luffy in Gear 5th hasn't used any fire-based moves yet? I think that could be Luffy's next upgrade. Yeah, imagine Red Rock but in gear fifth form. I think that right there could do some pretty mean damage. Uh, so now we cut over to another battlefront and we see that Saturn is approaching the Thousand Sunny. I don't know how he did it, but Saturn is like climbing up with his spider legs up to this sky island. And Usopp is ready to fight. You know, Usopp has the slingshot out. Chopper's freaking out. Chopper's calling him a crab. Uh, Nami's there as well. And it's like, dang, dude, can these guys take out Saturn? Oh, we do have to keep in mind that Brooke and Robin are also here too. So we have a 5v1. And I am really looking forward to this matchup. I want to see what the Straw Hats right here are capable of against a member of the Gorsei. Will they be able to damage him? Will they figure out a way around his regeneration? I have no clue. But I do think that the group we have up here in the Labo phase could come up with some ideas because everyone up here are very crafty fighters. I mean, we got Usopp, we got Chopper, we got Nami. We even have Brook who just straight up fights with his soul. It's like, okay, you know, like if, if there was a straw hat group to first damage a Gorosei member, I think this is the group I would bet on, honestly. I mean, Brook and his soul abilities, man, like I don't know how it would relate to these guys, but maybe if you can't hurt their physical body, Maybe Brook can hit their spiritual body. You know, maybe Usopp could try to subdue him with pop greens. Maybe natural abilities work. Maybe lightning works. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I am looking forward to this matchup a lot. And while it is pretty scary that he's showing up here, I think that the Straw Hats will do just fine, especially given the fact that Zoro and Jimbei should be here any minute now, right? Like, oh, you know, Saturn versus Usopp and Nami and Chopper. Yeah, that's pretty scary. But when you know that Zoro is like 30 seconds away, 
it's like, okay, come on. Zoro versus Saturn. You know, Jinbei versus Saturn. All right, let's be for real for a minute, right? Uh, I don't think they're going to beat Saturn, but like I said, I, I think they will be able to damage him to a point where he does have to regenerate, which would give us enough time to actually escape. The Gorosei regenerate very quickly, but it still takes some time. So all we really have to do is, you know, knock him back and then Kude bursts off the island and then that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's sad because it does feel like Saturn is the least threatening of the Gorosei. But then again, his opponent at the time was Sun God Nika Luffy. So it, it's hard to hold that against Saturn. So maybe he does show out here, you know, maybe now that he's not dealing with a ridiculous power like Luffy, he will actually get to flex on these straw hats. But like I said, I don't know. You know, there's five of them here, right? The straw hats are no joke. So yeah, I feel like the outcome of this battle could go either way until Zoro and Jinbei show up. Also, no, on to the next battlefront. We see Venus showing up in front of Bonnie and Frankie. And I, I'm gonna say it right here, but this is a bad matchup, right? Yo, we got, we got a swordsman versus Frankie and Bonnie. Yeah, yeah, this is gonna be rough. Uh, but we do have to remember, Sanji, he's nearby. Oimo and Kashi are also heading to the ship, so they will have their backup pretty soon. Uh, as far as what Frankie could do against Venus, I'm not exactly sure. If Frankie had General Frankie with him, I'd be singing a different tune, because General Frankie has the V-Saber, so maybe we could have seen some really cool sword clashes, but... Yeah, Frankie doesn't have General Frankie with him. As far as Bonnie goes, I think she could tap into the Sun God Nika powers a little bit and stall Venus for a second. But, you know, at the end of the day, a swordsman is always going to be Sun God Nika's biggest threat, right? Like Luffy, whenever he stretches, he is very wary of people with blades. And I think Bonnie should be no different. I, I think that if Bonnie stretches carelessly in front of Venus, she could end up with a, you know, Luffy, Mihawk, Marine Ford situation where she's like, oh no, he's going to cut off my hands if I hit him. So yeah, I really do think this is a fight where we have to wait for backup, like either Oimo and Kashi or Sanji, or maybe even Luffy and Dory and Brogy, right? Because they are, you know, heading back to the giant ship. Uh, so yeah, this group will have a lot of backup pretty soon, but I am excited to see how Frankie and Bonnie fend off this attacker. Also, Atlas is here, but I mean, come on. Atlas got one shot by Rob Lucci. So if I were to be painfully honest, I'm not expecting Atlas to do too much. Maybe Atlas sacrifices herself for the Straw Hats, Bonnie and Frankie. But, you know, outside of that, I, I really think we could just erase Atlas from the situation and not too much would change. So now, onto the final parts of the chapter, we have Marcus Mars showing up in front of the broadcasting Den Den Mushi inside of Punk Records. And he says, yo, Vagapunk, your luck has ran out. I found it. But before he gets the chance to destroy the Den Den Mushi, something catches his eye. You know, Marcus Mars, you know, he has that crazy shading like he's witnessing something insane. And he looks up, you know, the, the guy looks up and then all we get are some sound effects. We get the glob glob burr, burr, burr sound effect and it's like, okay, what is that? You know, uh, apparently it's the bubbling sound effect. Sorry if my noises weren't exactly up to par there, but they are bubbling sound effects at the end of the day. What is doing this? So there are a couple of guesses that I've come up with and there's a couple of guesses that I've seen people talk about. So let's take a second and go over the possibilities and what this could be. So, my first guess as to what this is, could be a brand new Seraphim. So back when we first met the Jinbei Seraphim, what we saw behind him was this giant green test tube. It looks like when the Seraphim aren't active, they are resting inside of those liquid containers. And in those containers were bubbles. There were bubbles in there. And not to mention, the green blood that the Seraphim have all have bubbles in them. So when I think of bubbles, on Agat Island, that is the first thing my mind goes to. So yeah, maybe Vegapunk was hiding his ultimate Seraphim here inside of Punk Records to defend the Den Den Mushi. Which now brings up the next question of what kind of Seraphim could we be looking at? Personally, I think this could be a Buggy Seraphim because out of all of the Warlords, Buggy has that reputation, bro. He was a part of Goldie Roger's crew. He was a cabin brother to Shanks. You know, like Buggy, he's kind of a menace. You know, if you don't know him, if you only know Buggy's lore, the guy's a madman, right? He's a living, walking legend. And one thing to keep in mind too about Buggy is that he was the most recent addition to the Shishibukai 
right before the two-year time skip started. I know some people are saying Blackbeard takes that spot, but you have to imagine it like this, right? Blackbeard beat Ace, and then just a month afterwards, he throws away his Warlord title. I don't think there was enough time for Vegapunk to research Blackbeard and to get DNA to make a Seraphim of him. Whereas Buggy, on the other hand, is completely different. You know, Buggy has been a Warlord for two years, right? You know, Weevil was also added in during that time frame and same with Law, but we don't know exactly when that happened. So yeah, Buggy, you know, out of Weevil and Law and Blackbeard has been a Warlord for a longer period of time. So if this is the legendary Buggy Seraphim, that I could see him putting in some work, right? You know, maybe Vegapunk saved all the fireworks for this Seraphim right here. Maybe he has, you know, all the Devil Fruits, or maybe he has the strongest Paramecia that Vegapunk could find. No, I, I think Vegapunk could get really wacky with it. And another option that I came to after thinking about a new Seraphim would be Dragon. I had a pause for dramatic effect. Uh, not Monkey D Dragon. I, you know, <laughs> sorry, sorry guys, sorry guys. Uh, not Monkey D Dragon, but I do think this could be a dragon monster or some brand new monster in general. Because going back to Punk Hazard, Vegapunk was the one who actually made that red dragon that Zoro killed at the beginning of the arc. So we know that Vegapunk can create monsters. So who's to say that Vegapunk didn't create another dragon type monster here to defend this Denden Mushi? Like, come on, I highly doubt that Vegapunk would leave this Denden Mushi unattended. There's got to be some guardian of the snail out there, and I wouldn't be surprised if Vegapunk created something just for this one role. One idea that I just thought of that would be absolutely silly would be if Vegapunk this entire time has been hinting at what's guarding the Denden Den Mushi. Okay, so, so this is more of a joke than an actual theory of mine, but uh, what if Vegapunk created a coffee monster to defend the Denden Den Mushi? Because, you know, last chapter, the chapter before, and even this chapter, whenever Vegapunk talks about the timer, it's always been accompanied with this running gag of Vegapunk wanting to drink very hot coffee, right? It, time and time again, he's been talking about this dang Vegapunk coffee, and it's like, okay, what if it's a giant coffee machine or a coffee monster? I, I don't know. Like I said, it's more of a joke than anything. But the fact that Vegapunk to this chapter is still talking about coffee. Kind of funny. Maybe Oda has some coffee problems. You know, maybe this is Oda poking fun at his assistants for getting him bad coffee. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, uh, one idea I saw people talking about and I really like this idea too. But what if it isn't something that's going to defend the Denden Mushi? And what if instead, it's just a giant brain in a jar? Because this is punk records, right? This is where all the Vegapunk brains are stored due to the no me, no me, no me. And so far, we haven't seen any brains. Like if you look behind Mars, it's pitch black. There's, there's nothing there. There should be brains out the wazoo behind him, but that's not the case. So maybe in front of Marcus, it is just a giant brain. Uh, but yeah, if that is the case though, then rest in peace this broadcast signal because I don't know how a giant brain will be able to stall Marcus Mars for a full 60 seconds. Uh, but hey, thank you guys for stopping by and listening to my rambling for like the past, what, like 40 minutes-ish? So, something like that, something, maybe, maybe like 10 minutes. Maybe I'll cut this down into a 10 minute video. Uh, but yeah, hey, thank you guys again for joining me. I'll catch you guys on the next chapter of One Piece. My name is Sai, and I'm signing out. Peace.